hello, hello, beautiful people. Uh, thank you so much for being here and welcome to our event with Roy Richard Grinker for his new book, Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. Um, uh, with him in conversation tonight is friend uh, to Booksmith and author of Neurotribe, Steve Silberman. My name is Evan Karp and I'm the events manager for Booksmith. We are an independent bookstore and mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. Uh, tonight though, of course, we are here to celebrate Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. Um, uh, joining uh, uh, Roy in conversation is Steve Silberman. Steve is an award-winning science writer and the author, author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, which Oliver Sacks called a sweeping and penetrating history presented with a rare sympathy and sensitivity. The book became a widely praised bestseller in the United States and the United Kingdom. His TED Talk, The Forgotten History of Autism, has been viewed more than a million times and translated into 35 languages. He lives with his husband, Keith, in San Francisco. And Steve, um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you. And in fact, I live two blocks from the booksmith. So you're, which you're is a wonderful thing. Cl closer to the store than I am, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Roy Richard Grinker is professor of anthropology and international affairs at the George Washington University. He's the author of several books, including Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism, and he lives in Washington, DC. Um, that's it for me. I'm very excited for this conversation and I'm happy to turn it over now um, to Roy and to Steve. Thank you both so much for being here. And um, Roy, congratulations on the book today is, is pub day. So um, we're very happy to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I'm very, very honored to be here with uh, this man I will call Richard. Is that correct, uh, Richard? What people call me, <laughs> yeah. Right, um, because my own book would never have existed if Richard had not written Unstrange Minds. It very much established an intellectual foundation uh, for my own book and just gave me hope that the world was changing in a positive direction, which is exactly what we're gonna be talking about tonight uh, in several ways. Um, Richard, in your introduction to this book, you write, quote, we need not surrender to stigma as if it is natural to marginalize otherness and difference. Stigma isn't in our biology, it's in our culture. It is a process we learn from within our communities and we can change what we teach. And then later you write, it's about time we recognize that normal is a damaging illusion. These lines I think succinctly art, uh, articulate the big idea of nobody's normal. So just as a little introduction to our conversation, could you tell our readers what big idea you would like them to take away from nobody's normal? Well, I think that the most important thing to me is that we identify the things that we've been doing right. And we have been doing a lot of things right. There are heroes in Nobody's Normal. These, these are the students who come to me in my classes and say, I have ADHD or I have Tourette syndrome and I might say something and I'd like to talk to the class that I might disturb them or they might not understand me or I have autism and I might not look like I'm paying attention. I find the heroes to be the people who are establishing autism programs at work and are facilitating people to become integrated into work and community life to a degree that we've not seen before. Now, this isn't to say that everything's great, but the book identifies the pathways that we're on, starting in the early uh, Industrial Revolution uh, to this time uh, in the 21st century, where we're really uh, embracing the idea that neurodivergency and also mental illnesses are part of the human condition. And if the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it's that no one is immune to mental illnesses. Like my grandfather said during World War II, these are not, these patients that he was treating in his psychiatric unit were not abnormal people. They were normal people in abnormal circumstances and they got sick and they needed help. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. Uh, I don't wanna come off as a Pollyanna. Uh, a lot of the progress that we've made in reducing the shame, secretiveness, and stigma of things like autism, depression, PTSD, and so on, uh, are not accompanied by major reductions in the stigma of addictions and schizophrenia. And so I really, um, I, I wanna caution people that I'm not trying to say that everything's 
That's great, uh, Richard. Thank you. Um, I have a very basic question for you about your life's path. Given that your great grandfather, grandfather, and father were psychiatrists and you're married to a psychiatrist, why didn't you become a psychiatrist? Well, you know, I had this typical childhood analyzing dreams at breakfast, um, you know, making sure I knew what the Oedipus complex was before I turned four. I, it was a difficult uh, thing to grapple <laughs> with a lot of the, um, the material that was discussed around the breakfast and the dinner table. And um, I, I really looked for some way to make my own path. Um, I also was intimidated. I felt my father and my grandfather were giants in their fields and I didn't wanna compete with them. And it was when I got to college that I found anthropology and I thought, wow, here's a way that I can approach the subject of psychology without becoming a doctor, without becoming a psychiatrist uh, and also satisfy my curiosity about the world. And so what anthropology permitted me to do was uh, basically everything that, you know, that I wanted to see the world, to study psychology, but also to explore the variations in how people think and how they feel and how those things are a product of our culture and our history encapsulated in the quote that you gave at the beginning of your, the, this presentation, which is, you know, the thing that is so essential about anthropology is that we denaturalize things. We say the way we think about X or Y isn't the way we have to, because there are other cultures that think differently. And if other cultures think differently, then, well, we can change the way we think too. That is great. Can you get, and feel free to go on with this answer because it's, really interesting information. Can you give us some examples from other cultures of uh, what societies are doing to continue the work of eradicating the stigma around mental illness? Well, there's some American Indian communities uh, which really resist the notion that depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicidality um, are brain diseases, that they're somehow products of an individual's faults or weaknesses or some sort of brain disease. And they see mental illnesses as the product of longstanding injustice and inequality. And so they appreciate that when the person is sick, they're sick because of the complex interaction between someone and their environment. There are places in Oceania where when people experience mental illnesses, they see this as an opportunity to reinforce and invigorate and cement social ties and people come together rather than split wow. apart or shame the person. And there are many other places like that, I, that I profile in the book, for example, in uh, Namibia in the Kalahari Desert where I've done research, where there's a real difference between how somebody uh, manages and thinks about a, a serious mental illness in a clinic and how they think about it at home. Let me give you an example. There's a man named Tomzo who lives in the Kalahari Desert uh, in Namibia. He's a member of the Junfuansi group, a hunter-gatherer, and he started hearing angry voices, really disturbing, terrible voices telling him to do terrible things. Um, so first he went to a healer who tried to calm the spirits and explain what was happening. And he said that this is not your fault, Tomzo. You are sick because somebody did something wrong in the past and spirits are coming back to torment someone and they randomly came to you. And by communicating that to the village, they're basically saying it's not his fault. He is actually a victim. He's somebody we actually have to care for. And because he wasn't able to quiet the spirits completely, he decided to walk 12 miles to a Norwegian non-government organization clinic where he got an antipsychotic medication and it quelled and, and really, uh, for, at least for the time being while I was there, uh, his delusions, his hallucinations, his voices were diminished significantly. But the person at the Norwegian clinic wrote down schizophrenic on the- Right. Right? right. Um, yep. So- he goes home, he has no symptoms. I ask people about his sickness and they say, but he's not sick anymore. Right. In the clinic, just 12 miles away, 
he has a very different disease, right? He's got schizophrenia in one, and he's got a spiritual uh, illness in the other. And in one, he's branded, basically, a schizophrenic, a new kind of human being. Whereas in the village, right. he's Hamza. And right. he's not sick so long as his symptoms are at bay. So there are many ways in which other societies handle these things. Now, at the same time, there are people with serious mental illness who are rotting in deplorable situations throughout the world. I wasn't going around the world to document the cases of horror. We know those very well. What we haven't heard about is some of the things that people are doing right. And it is no surprise that when scientists have done longitudinal studies of schizophrenia, they find that in rural and, and uh, non-industrial societies, people with schizophrenia have fewer psychotic episodes, less severe psychotic episodes, and better social and work outcomes than they do in industrialized societies. Why? Great. They have better social supports. Yeah, I was very, very touched in your book by uh, the story of the, ki the kid, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, Geshe in the Geshe. Yes, he, he Yeah, yeah. Sick child, yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, his, his father, uh, he, he would probably be diagnosed as non-speaking autistic mm -hmm. in, in America, contemporary America, but his father asked why he should be taken to the doctor because, quote, he is great at herding the goats. He always knows when they are uh, in the day, he always knows where they are in the day or night. And his father also said that Geshe has a great memory and finds whatever they lose in the bush, like knives or arrows, which struck me as similar to the way that neurodiversity act activists or advocates look at autism as a mixture of gifts and challenges. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I just want to throw a plug in here. Have you seen the new film, The Reason I Jump? which is about non-speaking autistics worldwide. I have not been able to see it. I, I was looking for it and it wasn't streaming anywhere and I'm still looking for it, but thank you. I, I think it's streaming now, but yes. it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and it goes far beyond the best-selling book that it was based on. I would recommend it to everyone. But um, you know, for, for decades really uh, that I wrote about in my book, autism was looked at as like a baffling enigma or mysterious plague. Um, and obviously, the people in Geshe's world thought differently about uh, Geshe's autism. And there's that wonderful moment when uh, Geshe's father said, so, you know, someone says, or you might say, actually, what's going to happen to Geshe when you die? And uh, his father, you know, points out his neighbors and their friends and says, well, we won't all die at once. Um, that's a very, yeah. yeah. I think it's a really important point because one of the problems, one of the sources of the stigma of not just mental illness, but disability in general in Western Europe and North America has been this idea that we should all be autonomous, independent uh, uh, people, accountable and responsible to ourselves, masters of our domain, and that we don't need to depend on others and the dependence is something that we should be ashamed about. Um, my daughter has autism and I don't ever want her to not live with me. Geshe's family and village doesn't want him to leave the village, but we've created this idea of, you know, valuing the person who's independent and produces the most and devaluing the person who's dependent and doesn't produce. Well, what does that say about a stay at home parent? What does it say about somebody who wants to do something that isn't necessarily going to achieve high monetary gain? Um, does it mean that they have no value, that they're worthless, that they can't lead a meaningful life? And so one of the things that I find the literature on stigma to be really deficient in is an analysis of this deeply rooted notion of individuality and independence and how that has contributed to the ongoing stigma of disabilities. I think that we may be getting away from that. Certainly people living at home with their parents during the pandemic uh, is no shame because they have nowhere else to go and they're home and no one's you know, looking at them and saying, oh, you're, you're such a child that you're 22 years old and you're living with your parents. It's, it's now become more of an expected um, sort of thing. And I think we just, we really need to appreciate that to be dependent is not to be uh, weak. 
to be dependent is part of the human condition. We all depend on each other. Exactly. And one of the uh, critiques of, like you mentioned the autism at work programs, which are great, but one of the critiques of uh, that way of thinking in a way is that under capitalism, which I believe is a, uh, the title of a section of your book, people are considered worthless if they're not generating value, you know? So, oh, autistic people are not worthless. They can work, you know? <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about how capitalism exerts uh, a pressure really towards stigma for people who are unable to be really productive or money earning or whatever? Yeah, I think it's, um, it, what you're talking about, Steve, is, uh, is, is a difficult uh, issue because there's this paradox that on the one hand, yeah. we live in a capitalist society. And on the other hand, we don't want capitalism to hurt people who may not fit into its ideals, into its ideologies. And so, you know, you take autism, for example, um, the um, autistic self-advocate Alex Plank was, ta was talking to him one day and he said, you know, we have the good doctor, right? And we have Bill Gates and other people who we can say are, you know, on the spectrum, but we don't have the good filer or the grocery bagger, the good grocery bagger. I mean, we wouldn't have that, right? And so um, I've encountered um, this many times where I've interviewed parents and they say, well, I don't want my child to be bagging groceries or doing this or that. And one woman, I actually, you know, in an interview, I kind of challenged her on it. And I said, well, why not? And she said, it's beneath my daughter. Well, the daughter loves bagging groceries, adores bagging groceries. She looks forward to work every day. She loves the fact that she's good at it. She loves the fact that the same customers come back regularly. So there's a routine and a structure and she knows where she's supposed to be and what she's supposed to do. Why is that not a life worth admiring and valuing if she loves what she's doing and she's an essential worker too, right? I mean, this yep. is the sort of thing. We had a, a, a period once where we were trying to get our daughter a job uh, at a um, drugstore. And uh, she had a little trial period, uh, stock, she was stocking things. And we went in and we talked to the staff with our daughter and tried to make sure that our daughter understood uh, what her tasks were. And I remember that um, the person said, well, Isabel, what's the first thing you have to do in the morning? And Isabel said, well, in the morning, the first thing is I'm a cleaning lady. And that's because she comes in and she has to clean up. And I remember that the manager sort of snapped at her, admonished her and said, you are not a cleaning lady. You are a retail associate. And it was a really powerful moment for me because I felt like I was seeing the devaluing of certain kinds of work in process. This was teaching people that there were certain things that were not highly valued. And it was a really you know, eye-opening experience. That's profound, yeah. There's a lot of talk in the, in the neurodiversity community about how uh, autistic interests are framed. And so, you know, in the psychiatric literature, you talk about obsession or uh, circumscribed interests. Uh, the very first description of what's, uh, you know, eventually became called Asperger's syndrome in America, was written by two psychiatrists who profiled these kids. And one of the kids was like, he seemed to be interested in everything. Like he knew the names of the plants all around the residential facility where he lived. He understood mortgages really deeply. Um, there, was, there was another kid who would give lectures on the to the other kids. And yet the title of the paper was Children with Circumscribed Interests. Those kids had a lot more <laughs> interests going on than most people their age. But because they had autism, because they had this diagnosis, then their interest became an expression of pathology rather than passion. Yeah. And that's, that's a point that a lot of neurodiverse, right. uh, neurodivergent advocates make. I, I want to build on what you're saying um, because it's very easy to get caught up in talking about autism and neurodiversity 
and not appreciate what autism and neurodiversity has done for other aspects of the human condition. One of the mm -hmm. things that struck me in these work programs was mm -hmm. how all of the managers said that the autism work programs generalized, that the, the value of it generalized to the whole um, workforce. What that meant was that people with depression or people with anxiety now felt more comfortable talking about their conditions and asking for help. I interviewed uh, a Michael Fieldhouse, uh, who's an executive at the cybersecurity company CXS in Australia, and met with him at my office when he was in DC on a work trip. And he had just been approached by a woman who said that she wasn't sure if her work was up to par, she wasn't feeling herself and wanted him to know um, that she was having symptoms of menopause and that she was having some trouble regulating her temperature and she was going to the bathroom a lot and she just you know, didn't feel herself. And Fieldhouse looked at me and he said, this is what happened because of the autism program. Can you imagine oh, 20 wow. years ago yeah. that a woman would feel comfortable coming to me about something that clearly identifies her as a woman, even though it's normal hormonal change of aging and an aging woman at that and talking about these things with her male superior. He said, that's an amazing thing. That wouldn't have happened here unless we had opened up the floodgates by saying we fully embrace difference. That is absolutely fascinating. That's wonderful. I went to a, uh, a conversation at a uh, Silicon Valley company called Square. It's a payment company. They make those little dongles that you know you can do pay. And um, it was originally uh, started by uh, uh, an autistic guy, but there were lots of different kinds of people who came to that meeting because it showed them that it was worth asking for the kinds of accommodations that you need, whether you have dyslexia or ADHD or depression or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think that's a really, really important point. Um, you mentioned in the book that Isabel, your daughter, quote, now proudly self-identifies as autistic, a term only a few decades ago was considered a symptom of schizophrenia and evidence of poor parenting. And uh, we talked about how influential your book, Unstrange Minds, was on my own book. Um, talking with other parents of autistic kids, I've heard so many stories of you know, their kid is born and then uh, they get these dire predictions from authorities. Speaking very personally as the father of an autistic young woman, what has surprised you about the arc of Isabel life? What is different from what you expect? Well, it's a tough question. It's a big question, but I would have to say mm -hmm. that the thing that has surprised me the most is how much she has continued to grow, to mature, to find things that she likes and that are meaningful, even in her adulthood. And she's nearly 30 years old now. But we're told often, well, there's a window of plasticity and we can't miss that window of plasticity. And so I, as a father, would get very upset at every birthday because I would think, oh, we missed, maybe we didn't do enough in that year between the time she was five and she was six or between the years of seven and eight. But some of her greatest advances and maturation have occurred in her twenties. And she is an animal care um, worker at a federal research lab. And uh, by all accounts, her colleagues love her and she's been there now almost three years and uh, and, and, and we never would have expected that. We never would have ex expected that. For the other thing that surprised me is, you know, really just how much so, mu so much of the world has come to be interested in autism. Remember I mentioned the TV show, The Good Doctor? Well, let me uh, tell you that that was produced first as a Korean show and was then oh, wow. produced by Hollywood, by wow. Daniel Day Kim, who brought it here to the United States. And what a remarkable thing, because I started doing research in Korea on autism in um, the first decade of the new millennium, and I couldn't even find people to talk to about autism. It was so 
shameful. And people would say, yeah, I know somebody whose kid has autism, but I could never reveal that I know that. And now we've got a very, very different situation where you actually have people talking about it throughout the media. It's a, amazing how quickly things can change. There's also, I should put a plug in for what I think is a pretty fun uh, series um, called It's Okay Not To Be Okay, which is a Korean drama. Um, it's a much better title in English. The Korean, <laughs> the Korean title is Psycho, But That's Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> but it takes, place, yeah. it takes place in a psychiatric hospital. And the person with bipolar disorder who seeks help at the hospital is praised for being strong. The person with post-traumatic stress disorder is seen as resilient and strong because he seeks care. And then most of the film or the, the, the episodes revolve around the relationship between a young man and his elder brother who has autism. Mm. And you would first think that the younger brother's taking care of the older brother, but by the end of the show, you see that they're actually taking care of, of each other. And it's fascinating to see that in a society where autism had been so secretive, so hidden away. I mean, so hidden away that when I first went there, the experts in child psychiatry in South Korea told me, we don't really have any autism here. Oh, God. Yeah, it's like Mao saying there was no homosexuality in China or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, why do you prefer the term mental illness to mental disorder? It's always bothered me that the National Institutes of health institutes like Can National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and on and on and on are named for diseases. But we don't have that for mental illness. We, because mental illness is so stigmatizing, I guess they had to call it the National Institute of Mental Health because we can't bring ourselves to say illness. I think we need to talk about mental illnesses and what they are, that they are a form of suffering and that we can treat them and that people can get care from their family, from counselors, from other mental health professionals and not you know, hide the fact that there is real suffering there. I also don't like the term disorder because it's really a technician's term. It's really a and kind of, you know, it's a disease, it's a disorder. Um, at least in social science, the term illness is really a more phenomenological term that reflects the total experience of the person. And anybody who's ever been sick knows that you're not just sick and you don't just experience that particular ailment. It affects your relationships with people, your self-image, it affects your finance, you know, it, it's a lived, fully a uh, complex and realized human condition. And so I prefer the term illness for that reason. And then the third reason that I prefer the term illness is because disorder still um, kind of reinforces these old ideas that stigmatize like a, a screw loose, um, you know, uh, losing it, um, a mind falling apart, uh, a nervous breakdown, um, I could come up with many more as well. And I don't think we know what a coherent or ordered mind even looks like. That's an excellent point. And when people ask me why I don't call autism autism spectrum disorder in my book, I you know, somewhat cavalierly say it's because I don't claim to know what the order of the universe is supposed to be. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things that has happened in psychiatry uh, over the past half century or so is a move towards medication and towards like biological models rather than psychological models. And so, you know, I remember seeing when there were still ads for antidepressants on television, I remember seeing like the synaptic gap and then, you know, little, you know, <laughs> little things moving across the gap. And that was what depression was. Not enough of those little things. Mm -hmm. what, I what is the deception at the heart of really the direction that even the National Institutes of Mental Health uh, have embraced of thinking er of everything in terms of chemical imbalance and biological terms? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, this is there's a larger process that has happened over the last century, which social scientists sometimes call medicalization, right? Where things that we didn't use to medicalize, we now medicalize, like one's weight becomes a condition that's diagnosed, or uh, we, uh, you know, childbirth is almost entirely uh, encompassed within the hospital sector. Um, but it's, it's been a, a different kind of story when it comes to uh, mental illnesses, because the biological work and the neuroscientific research, as amazing as it's been, has not actually translated into better treatments or knowledge of the causes and pathophysiology of mental illnesses. And so psychiatry has always had this kind of inferiority complex. You know, the oncologist can cure cancer, but the psychiatrist can't really cure anything. They can just sort of ameliorate symptoms. And so I think a lot of um, mental health professionals have been fundamentally embarrassed by psychiatry. And they think, well, the way that we will do this is by making psychiatry like every other branch of medicine, scientific, empirical, brain-based. It's a brain problem. Nancy Andreasen called it the broken brain. And maybe that'll help break down the barriers to care. If you broke your leg, you'd never say, I'm not going to go get it. I go to a doctor because you broke your leg. Well, if you have a quote unquote broken brain, we know that the time from first psychosis to first uh, a psychiatric visit for somebody uh, with schizophrenia is 74 weeks. You wouldn't wait 74 weeks to have your broken leg looked at. So I can understand why they may want to do this, but there are a couple of problems with it, very serious ones. First of all, reconceptualizing mental illnesses as diseases of the brain has actually increased stigma in many parts of the world. Instead of saying, you know, like many Native American groups, your mental illness is a product of your upbringing and your society and the poverty and the hardships that you've dealt with and the discrimination over the years combined with um, your, your, you know, personal experiences. They say, oh, well, there's something wrong with your brain. Well, then you're afraid of that person. Then you see that there's something wrong with that person and don't see that mental illnesses are the product of more factors than we can imagine. Self, society, history, family, genetics, and I could go on and on. And I think for me as an anthropologist, I really dislike the neurobiological approach to mental illness because it tries to take culture out of the equation. It tries to take culture and history out of it. Oh, it's not about the fact that you're living in a community in which you've been beaten down and traumatized repeatedly um, that may have uh, contributed to your mental illnesses, but there's something wrong with your brain. You know, in the 1700s and the 1800s, we had lots of scientists in Europe who became known as phrenologists. And they tried, <laughs> yes. right, right? They tried to find the legible markers of pathology. Uh, Lambrosio said, you know, the prostitute was a woman whose second toe was this much larger than her. Right, right. Um, yeah. The shape of the nose and so on. And you know what they called those marks, like the certain shape of the nose or the, the eyebrow or the length of the earlobe? They called them stigmata. Wow. And today's stigmata are brain images. Today's, I mean, it's an attempt to remove culture from the equation, which can never happen. It can never happen. I want to give you an example from epigenetics. And this is really, really cutting edge research. And I can't claim expertise on it. But you know, we all go to school and take biology and learn that Lamarck was wrong. Lamarck said that species, individuals in a species could acquire characteristics during their lifetime. And then those acquired characteristics could be passed on to their offspring. And we learned that that's baloney. You can't lose an arm and then have a child and that child is born with one arm, doesn't work that way. But it turns out Lamarck wasn't entirely wrong. Epigenetic research has shown that many people who've experienced extraordinary trauma, wartime, famine, uh, repeated um, uh, insults by growing up in, a, uh, in adverse childhood circumstances, um, do have alterations 
in the regulation of the expression of their genes. And those changes in regulation can actually be passed on to their offspring who are then more predisposed to mental illness than they would have been otherwise. And in that yeah. case, it does not even make any sense to ask whether a mental illness is a biological or a cultural condition, right? It makes no sense to ask that because, because it's both of those things. Exactly. And um, I have a very dramatic example of how you can't take culture out of the equation in my own personal life in that when I was in high school, I was defined by the psychiatric establishment as having a serious mental illness. Uh, and so serious, it was criminal as defined by the legal establishment. I got questions on my male friends, you know. Now I'm called happily married <laughs> to my husband, Keith, <laughs> who's in the other room uh, doing remote teaching. But you know, that, wasn't be that wasn't because they found the gene for homosexuality or something. It was yeah. because po of political action. So I'm curious, you actually, um, you write, and I quote here, by turning homosexuality into a mental illness in the first half of the 20th century, psychologists and psychiatrists would highlight the dangers of sex and sexuality as a watchtower in the center of a prison yard illuminates everything around it. That's an amazing image, by the way. Thank you. Psy uh, psychopathology was the alibi for surveillance and discipline. So you spend a fair amount of time discussing homosexuality and nobody's normal. Why? I spent a lot of time talking about homosexuality because of the longstanding discrimination against um, people who are gay. Uh, longstanding uh, 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 firing people from jobs, discharging people from the military without benefits, and so on, because there was a development in the late 19th century to um, argue within the psychological disciplines that there was a category of people who could be called homosexuals. Now, this is not to say that you know, men who had sex with men in the 16th century were treated kindly, but if they were caught, it was not something that was different from any other kind of you know, what was considered a sexual perversion. So after Henry VIII passes in 1533, the anti-buggery law, yes, homosexual sex became illegal, but so did non-vaginal sex between a man and a woman. And so if you were, you, you were scared of being found out, you were just as scared of being found out doing either of these things. And you certainly were not scared of being labeled a particular type of person. Maybe it was considered a crime, but you weren't a homosexual. In fact, homosexual and heterosexual don't even become uh, invented until about 1892. And then homosexuality is such a recent concept, it doesn't even enter the Oxford English Dictionary until 1976. So uh, we're talking about how a set of experts created a new kind of human being, the homosexual, and then enforced a certain set of rules and discipline based on the idea that there was one kind of thing that was normal and one kind of thing that was abnormal. And you know, everybody knows about the Kinsey report. Well, Kinsey showed that a third of men had at some point in their lives achieved orgasm with another person of the same sex. Well, why is that not normal? I mean, why is that abnormal? 30%, right? So what we think about as normal isn't necessarily what people actually do. That's right. the point. Normal is defined by consensus by a group of experts. And there's a reason why we call things like psychology, psychiatry, anthropology, disciplines, right? Because they discipline, they structure. They tell us what is legitimate knowledge and what is illegitimate knowledge, what is appropriate behavior and what is not. They tell us, they come up with 10,000 steps you have to have a day or this much exercise or this much food or this many alcoholic beverages. And there is no number in nature for how many steps we should walk per day or for how many alcoholic <laughs> beverages right. we should walk per day. These are things that are created by, by consensus. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah, that's... we create it. And if we create something 
then we have to see it as um, defined by the context in which we created it. The context in which we created homosexuality uh, was one in which there was an effort to create a certain kind of false conformity to a new notion called normality, which is no longer the old mathematical term of normal meaning average, statistical average, but a, uh, an ideal, something to aspire to. Right, and in fact, if you don't aspire to it, you're diseased. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I should also point out that, you know, the intersectionality here, that um, the discrimination of people as mentally ill because they loved somebody of the same sex um, also coincides with class issues and with race issues. Um, one part of Nobody's Normal that's really important to me is the section on war. And in that section on war, I talk about how white um, soldiers were offered the opportunity to, who were gay, uh, were offered the opportunity to resign from the military, whereas black soldiers were discharged with something that's dishonorable, it's called a blue discharge charge, and they didn't get any benefits. And so there was clearly a racial disparity in how gay men and women were treated. Yeah, absolutely. And that also makes, you know, I'm also interested in poetry as well as psychology. And, you know, people say like, well, was Walt Whitman gay? You know, that's that entire was Lincoln, concept was with Lincoln. Right. And I mean, maybe Lincoln and Joshua Speed were afraid that they would be caught, but they were never afraid that they would be called homosexuals because there was no such concept. It didn't, right. even, it didn't even exist. Exactly, exactly. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question so we can go to Q&A because uh, I've gotten a couple of great questions and everybody who's watching to submit more to Evan, um, however that's done. Uh, you end the book with a brief discussion of Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel published in 1850, The Scarlet Letter. What lessons do you draw from that very old book for the present moment? And I would also ask you or invite you anyway to read a section of the book um, that is related to The Scarlet Letter. I I'm that was glad a very you asked if I could read it. That would, be, the book. that'd be easier for me to do just sure. read the question sure. and to, to sure. answer the question. Um, okay, so this is from the, let me get to it. Um, this is from the, um, uh, the last chapter of, of Nobody's Normal. And I'm, I'm sure people remember the Scarlet Letter. If you didn't read it in high school, you read it in college. <laughs> There's a remarkable passage at the end of Nathaniel Hawthorne's 1850, The Scarlet Letter, when after a long absence, Hester Prynne returns to the scene of her crime. As her punishment for adultery, she had worn an embroidered red letter A on her breast. But after all those years, not even the harshest judge would force her to continue wearing it. She decides of her own free will to keep it fastened to her blouse because the narrator tells us, the Scarlet Letter ceased to be a stigma which attracted the world's scorn and bitterness and became a type of something to be sorrowed over and looked upon with awe yet with reverence too. The village now saw her as a source of comfort and strength, not as a person stained with sin. When people suffered the dreary burden of a heart, especially in matters of love or misplaced passion, they visited her cottage for counsel. They knew Hester would understand their pain. The goal of the punishment was to marginalize Hester from society. But by claiming adultery for herself, as if with the pride of a 21st century LGBTQ advocate who has reclaimed the word queer from the bigots, she makes the letter a mark of dignity and experience rather than of shame. Both Hester's original stigma and its transformation into a sign of self-worth derived from her ongoing struggle between her individual character and her society's expectations a struggle Hester embraced by returning to her community. The question for us is whether we can win our own struggle and take ownership of the words and practices that exclude and discriminate. The many victories described in this book suggest that we can. Today, when someone wants their home or office to be neat and organized, they might say they're a little OCD. The moody person says they are a little bipolar, the introvert, I'm on the spectrum. 
I don't believe such phrases belittle the seriousness of these illnesses. When J Jerry Seinfeld says that he is on the autism spectrum, he does so with the full knowledge that many people with autism are profoundly intellectually disabled and need lifelong care. When a student tells me that she has PTSD after taking a final exam that was difficult, she is not unaware that PTSD can involve severe and debilitating anxiety and can sometimes lead to suicide. Using the vocabulary of mental illness validates the growing acceptance that mental illnesses are a matter of degree and that they all exist on a spectrum. Most importantly, speaking these words more freely disarms the stigma of those illness labels by making them part of the general human condition, as Hester did when she continued wearing the letter A. Hester's label, Hawthorne wrote, seemed to give her the ability to see into people's hearts, exposing the outward guise of purity as a lie. Because everyone Hester met kept some kind of secret, her label conveyed to others not only that she would be sympathetic to them, as if the A was an ancient degree in clinical psychology, but also that she was more similar to them than different. That's wonderful, Richard. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I want to go to audience questions uh, because we have to wind up by seven. But uh, here's a question from Beth Haggerty. Do you find less stigma in collectivist societies, even in dialogue ones? Uh, Steve, you cut out there no. for a second, but I believe the question- I'm sorry. Is the question... Sorry. I'm sorry, Steve, you cut out there for a Am moment. I, I think I heard the question, which is, is there less stigma in okay. collectivist societies? You know, every society yes. can demean and stigmatize something, and it does. But what it stigmatizes is different. How it stigmatizes is different. Now, that doesn't mean we surrender to it, but there are many communities in the world that we would consider to have very broad social supports where people live in extended families, where people are treated, treated quite, quite cruelly. But I think that one of the most cruel things is when there is a society that seeks to separate out people with disabilities and doesn't want to look at them and wasn't, doesn't want to interact with them. And when people who have a disability feel like they want to be invisible and don't want to be seen, that is the kind of stigma that um, persists in many societies, but particularly in the United States and Western Europe, especially for those conditions that threaten our ideals of autonomy and individuality and independence, like schizophrenia and like addiction. Yeah, that's great. Uh, here's a question from Annie B. Uh, I'm interested in hearing from or about people who've requested accommodations at work to help them do their jobs while dealing with depression, particularly nearly a year into this pandemic. Yeah, I, um, I wrote this book uh, before the pandemic really hit. So I have not been uh, able to write about uh, the pandemic. But one thing is clear, that there are uh, many people who've been working remotely, who wanted to work remotely because of disabilities, who are now allowed to do so. But, you know, argued for years. Why can't I work remotely? I'm in a wheelchair and I use a wheelchair. I'm differently able. I can't get here or there. Can I do some remote work? And people said, no, 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 that's impossible. It's kind of like overnight. Right. COVID has provided a new affordance for us and has helped a lot of people. Um, certainly it has hurt a lot of people too, but there are some uh, benefits uh, for, for, for people who wanted the kind of social distance for psychological reasons uh, that being in the workplace didn't offer, particularly in a workplace was not um, dis disabled friendly. You know, there is a uh, a kind of uh, axiom within disability studies that you're only disabled when the environment makes it so. The person who's differently able is only really disabled when there are no tactile uh, markers, when there's, there are no ramps, when there are no elevators. Um, but uh, I do think that 
uh, one of the things that COVID has done is it has shown us that nobody is immune to mental illnesses because we've all suffered. I've had more anxiety during this pandemic than I've had in, you know, since I can uh, remember. Uh, and there is a recent study uh, of 65 million medical records in the United States showing that uh, 18% of people within the first three months after their COVID diagnosis qual qualify for a mental illness, meet the criteria for a mental illness. Wow. And 5% meet criteria for a mental illness who have no history of any psychiatric disorder. So these are new diagnoses. Wow. Yeah, I've certainly been, you know, not just COVID, there have been other national events going on, but I, I certainly, yeah, I, I, I never, I never asked for a sleeping pill prescription for my doctor before a couple of months ago. I never needed it. You know, uh, yeah, it's really. Uh, been well, we've, we've been doing a study. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, ask me the question. No, please, no, please go on. I was, just I was gonna, gonna move on to the next question. We have been doing a study at George Washington University. Um, I'm one of the, the principal investigators of it with my colleagues, Sarah Wagner and Joel Kuypers on, um, on funerals and grieving and dying during the uh, the pandemic. And um, there are a lot of mental health consequences uh, related to the inability to have the kind of collective um, interactions that are so important for mourning. And I know this personally because my mother died uh, during the pandemic. I'm sorry. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, I, I thought about that. Uh, I know that we want to avoid hot button political issues, but I thought about that. I thought it was very good that Biden and Harris had a had a an event to honor uh, the people who've died of COVID. Because like, there's a lot of missing grief in American society right now. Um, you know, four hundred and fifty thousand people have died. Uh, you know. Uh, that's going to affect us psychically if we never get the chance to grieve those people. Sure. Um, yeah. So this is a question from uh, my friend Joe Kreitz. I'd be curious what Richard thinks about whether mental illnesses are actually illnesses or whether some are just 98th or second percentile rankings on one cognitive measure or another. Good question. You know how when we look at a color spectrum, we don't know exactly where red becomes orange or orange becomes yellow. This is a judgment call. And it is a judgment call about where shyness becomes autism, about when sadness becomes depression. And it is a judgment call based on whether or not the person is suffering to such an extent from some phenomenon, some psychological set of characteristics um, that they cannot work, that they can't sleep, that they can't uh, have the same relationships that they had before, uh, that they are having trouble maintaining a job. And so something is a mental illness when it impairs you to the degree that you need help. In the same way that you know a sore shoulder is not a torn ligament necessarily, um, or something that you have to see a doctor for, unless you really are suffering and, and, and can't use it. Um, so I think that where we see problems with the persistent stigma of mental illness in the US in particular, is where we start to see certain kinds of people as sort of inherently mentally ill, as used to be the case with homosexuality, but still is the case with transgender individuals, where there may, there's this gender dysphoria category that I think has no place in the DSM, uh, gender dysphoria uh, uh, becomes a way for this surveillance and discipline to take place again and again to say that somebody who's transgender is somehow automatically abnormal or sick or pathological. This is not to say that somebody who's transgender can't get depression, anxiety, an eating disorder, something else. And we are all, every person in the world is um, able to get a mental illness. But being transgender itself, that's not a mental illness. That's where we see the, the problem where whole categories of people are being branded. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
this last uh, thing that I will read is not really a question, but it's it's a wonderful comment from Carol Greenberg, who is one of the editors of uh, the Thinking Person's Guide to Autism, which is a fantastic resource yeah. uh, for both autistic people and their parents. Quote, I'm an autistic mother of an autistic teen. Dr. Grinker's comments about capitalism resonated with me. I often tell people who live with or professionally serve autistics that when they set independence as a goal, they're aiming too low. Interdependence serves everyone better. I, I and as the right. parent of an autistic child, I can't tell you how many times somebody has asked me the question, will your daughter be able to live independently one day? The people that I lived with in Namibia, they would never even think of asking that question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you everyone for being, and please buy Nobody's Normal. It's a fan. also. I would also recommend Unstrange Minds, uh, and I'd recommend Euro Tribes. And Steve, thank you. It's such, <laughs> such an honor to have had this conversation with you. Uh, you have been such a good and supportive friend over the years, and I'm really just eternally grateful for you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Evan. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, Evan. Yeah. No, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And congratulations on the book. Uh, this has been a wonderful Thanks. conversation and um, uh, it's, it's been a, an honor to host it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And congratulations on the book, Richard. Thank um, you. Best, best wishes with it and, and with everything. Um, to those of you who are tuned in, thanks for joining us. And um, I hope uh, you all take care and stay well out there um, wherever you are. And um, I uh, hope we can meet in person um, in the nearest future, but until then, I um, uh, hope you can check out some of our other events and um, to see you here uh, virtually. Um, thank you all. Thank you all so much and um, hope to see you soon. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Thank bye. you.